Have a seat. Good morning, Tara. For those who don't know me, my name is Ed Marcel. I serve as one of the pastors here. I'm really grateful for that assignment, too. On Sunday, we gather together. It's the first day of the week. It's the day in which Jesus rose from the dead. The day in which the resurrection happened is what we celebrate every single Sunday. And it's the time where often we just need a reset button, where we, in this constant movement of God, to remake our hearts to make us again in the image of God, we often need this time to be able just to set aside and respond to him. That, that's really what worship is. And we need the time to be able to hear from his word. That's where our response will come from. When we see him revealed, we're, we're then able to respond that way to him. We've begun a journey to take us through the entire story arc of the Bible. It's going to be about a, a three-year process as a series but it's going to be broken up into a lot of smaller sections in between. We, we just broke through that first one of creation a few weeks ago and have spent the last two weeks in this second chapter, the second portion of the patriarchs. And we began following the life of Abram. Now, you may know him as Abraham. God will change his name later. Uh, while I realize that's going to happen later, there are going to be moments where I probably call him Abraham because I'm just so used to doing that. So you can save the correction emails. I realize that I'm going to make that mistake, and uh, it, I'll say Abraham now and again when he's still Abraham. Uh, Abram. He, he's the prototypical man of faith. He, he's the first one. He's the father of faith, the Bible will call him. He's the one who has to wander based on the promises of God, not, not seeing them, but having to move by faith. Faith. And in many ways, his life is the model and blueprint for every one of our faith walks. He's a critical figure who the Jews will recognize as the father of all they have, and Paul will latch on to him and say, I can understand and explain justification through faith in Christ because of God's working with Abraham. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 15. So if you have your Bible, turn to Genesis 15. Uh, if you don't simply put your hand up, someone will bring you a Bible, and you can find your way to Genesis 15. We're going to be referring back to this a lot after we go through it, so I'd encourage you to put your hand up if you don't have a Bible and find your way to Genesis 15. We, we have followed Abram on his journey after a, a, a juncture that called him to respond in faith. And faith has that process of calling us from and to, and that's really what pilgrimage is, is made of. It's that responding to God that takes us away from something, but towards something he's promised, but we may not have seen yet. We're releasing things we have seen, things that we're comfortable with, things that have maybe even benefited us and protected us at times, to be able to follow after the unseen. Here's the roadmap for today as we head into Genesis 15. Uh, it is a chapter where large pieces of the Bible will go back to anchor their truth and theology. And like so many of these critical passages, it's really hard to cover everything in the allotted time that we have. So I'll encourage you to just dig deeply on your own throughout this week in Genesis 15. And if you're a part of small groups here at Terra, which I think is probably the most effective place for us to be able to discuss the Bible, to be known in community, to pray for one another. I'd encourage you that when this chapter comes up to get after that more deeply if there are things that, that you particularly want to focus on this time that we don't hit. Here's where I'll be going today. We'll, we'll be talking about the nature of fear and faith. In the series of Revelation and Response, Abram will have both. There will be moments where without a challenge to his heart, not without pushing back at God, he will follow after in faith. And we'll also see moments again where the father of faith, the blueprint for us, pauses in fear and turns away from that faithful pilgrim path. Then we'll talk about the covenant because this chapter God is going to mark with a, a contract of the ancient Near East and embellish it beyond. And we'll talk about those things that precede Abraham's understanding of what a covenant is, the preparations for the covenant in particular, and, and the purpose of this covenant. And then we'll, we'll land on the core of this whole encounter. What does it mean that in the life of Abram, God stopped him to make a covenant? And how does that impact us today? On some level, the question is simply, what does the covenant mean to me? How does the life of pilgrimage of faith call me to that path? And ultimately, 
how is this covenant really the heroic presentation of Jesus as Lord and Savior? Genesis 15, I'm going to read the whole chapter and we'll visit sections as we go back. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. For not Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, I'm sorry, Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven. Number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And when the sun had gone down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can be here today. Lord, I'm convinced that without this time, we would just be directionless. We would be busy without purpose. I'm convinced without times like this, Lord, we could easily end up hermits without community in our pilgrimage. So, Lord, we thank you for calling us together as the church. God, we ask that in this time, we would have grace to recognize the work of your spirit, that while our minds and hearts are challenged, you would still speak from greater than anything that any person could say or any man or this woman, and woman in this room could think, that you would bring genuine conviction of your presence upon us, that you would help us to see sin and turn from it in our lives, and help us to take pieces of our lives that we've held in darkness and hand them over to the kingdom of your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus, in whose name we pray now. Amen. There's something about the tension of fear and faith that is necessary for the dynamic of a pilgrim journey. We have to have the faith to hear from God and to follow him, that we trust his character, so we trust his word. We follow because he says so, not because he proves something. Those who recognize who he is recognize he's a rewarder of those who seek him. There's something of faith that calls every pilgrim to respond faithfully. But there's a natural response to all people. It seems that we're still people who are made up of primarily two things, water and fear. And we end up with this constant struggle of fear pulling back from where we would follow what God would have for us. We have moments of question. But here we begin with this phrase, after these things. It's a small reminder that the God of eternity shows up in the sequence of time. 
We know time as a timeline. We know time as our beginning, whether it's our birth, our beginning of a family lineage, our beginning of a job, our beginning of an education, and we know the process and the end. We're a God who knows the end from the beginning, not bound by time, always existing, never having an origin, never having an end, interrupts benevolently our timeline to share life with us. It's the central point of Christianity, the incarnation, that the eternal one would step into time with us. And here God graciously, having made promises and given direction to Abram, now steps in after a sequence of events. It's probably a good place for us to remind ourselves a little bit of where these sequences of events have taken Abram already. We know that years back, and some commentators will say it's been about a decade since he left Haran after his dad's death following the call of God to, to leave Ur, to leave Haran where his father had moved them, and now to begin this pilgrim journey. It's, it's been almost a decade for the 75-year-old man to follow on this journey. But that's the nature of reorienting our lives for God. There are things that we knew and were comfortable with that we, we end up leaving. They may have been determined by our own will. They may have been determined by tradition. We've always done things this way. They, they may have been determined by our religious codes or our fear, or fear and rebellion at religious codes. But when God shows up, it's, it's different. The categories go. It's not about religion. It's not about tradition. It's not about ethnicity. It's about following him. And so Abram had heard that God promised him land and seed and blessing. But the restoration wasn't instantaneous. There's a patience to faith that's required of every pilgrim. God's called him to follow. And it's clear later in this passage that we already read, God will say, I am the Lord your God who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But the journey's been hard at moments in the steps of faith. There was the incident in Egypt when things got rough. There was a famine, and they, they moved down towards Egypt. And Abram was so afraid of self-injury and protecting himself that he ended up giving Pharaoh his wife, pawning her off as his sister to protect himself. Fear had pushed him off that path of faith. He lived long enough through this to see the grace of God bring him to repentance, that turning. And God would bring him out of Egypt back to the place where he had built altars earlier. It seems like that moment had a great impact on his life because he lives differently. He's not living out of self-protection. He'll separate from his nephew, Lot. And when he does it, he says, Lot, you pick whatever you want. You take the land in the direction you want to go to. This generous God that I live with and serve, I'm willing to risk being generous as he is generous. And so he sends Lot out to choose wherever he'll go. Then there's a war that will happen just immediately before this in context. A war of multiple kings coming together in battle. And by the end, this old, reluctant pilgrim now becomes a warrior without ever having asked, saw great success, and worshiped the king of Salem, Melchizedek, at the end of all this. So why now? Well, God sees the place for more revelation needed even in the midst of that faithfulness. And it says that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. I don't really know what to make of uh, the auditory nature of the vision that he has. I would think the word of the Lord came in hearing, but Abram must have saw something that he doesn't say. But what was important wasn't what the vision contained visually. It was the message and the source of that. It was the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord said, fear not, Abram. I'm your shield and your reward will be very great. It's a moment where God has to remind this pilgrim who has shown these instances where he's afraid. He's afraid that he won't be protected. He's afraid in the famine he won't be provided for. And God has to say again, incredibly graciously, the way a parent learns they have to repeat themselves to their children that it's not heard once. The, the way teachers learn they have to repeat themselves to students it's not caught once. The way lovers learn to tell each other they love them again and again because it's not always owned and believed fully just once. He reminds him that I, I am your shield and your provision will be great. It's the importance of triangulating the path of a pilgrim from two points. 
who you are, really who you are, what you believe, really what you believe, and taking who God says he is and what he calls us to. See, God's not intimidated by our fear and doubt. We might be fearful in presenting ourselves before God in those moments, but he's incredibly gracious to show up and bring him this word of don't be afraid. The word of the Lord is always a reflection of a person. I I hope you pause and consider that the next time you read your Bible. These aren't just statements of theology. These aren't just collections of old sacred books. These are reflections of a person. Trust the word because you trust the Lord. Open your heart to the word of God because you believe the God of the word. If you trust him, you hear him. I understand distrust over words in our time is really natural. We're surrounded, just an avalanche of words falling over us constantly from media, billboards, radio, television, internet. Most of them really just trying to get us to perform something, buy something, do something for someone else. And we can get really defensive and become distrustful in our nature. But we need to carefully put that away, to enter the word of God with a risky defenselessness. To say, even if it makes me uncomfortable at moments, I'm going to let that word come to me. Even if it calls me out at moments and says, I cannot live this way that I've been living anymore, I'm going to step into the word of God, trusting the person of God, and walk in there in some level defenseless because of that. Abram receives this word, and we know from Proverbs 27, 6, the wounds of a friend are faithful. Even when the word of God stings you, you need to hear this. Abram takes the word, and God spells out some very particular things. I'm protecting you. The pilgrim journey is hard. You'll be places you didn't expect to be going. The the pilgrim journey is something you can't always prepare for. You won't see your provisions in the moment, but you'll be richly provided for in me, in the midst of what you don't see. I, I think what God's pushing us towards is the very important distinction between faith in a promise of God and faith in the potential of God. Faith in the potential of God is very theoretical. It's where we say God could. If he wanted to, I believe he could protect me. Doesn't seem to notice, I call out regularly. If he wanted to, God could open heaven's floodgates and provide for me limitlessly. I believe that potentially he could do that if he chose to. See, that's where we have this distant belief in the potential of God. Belief in the promises of God becomes incredibly personal. He said this and spoke it towards me, and I don't doubt his character, so I have to believe his word. See, Abram heard these words of provision and blessing before, but in moments of dark challenge, they became potential. They weren't promises that he always clung to. Now Abram can say, I I clearly know that God has said this. It's not just that it could be true. He has said it is true. Faith, Faith has to exercise faithfully the promise of God. That's what faith does. It becomes faithful. And God led with these words, don't be afraid. But why would Abram be afraid? This man who was willing to leave everything by faith, this man who had seen God stand up for him multiple times before, because he's still a man of flesh. But flesh has its own weaknesses and limitations. Where in the autumn time and the leaves begin to fall, and the Bible says that that's what flesh is like. Leaves come in their season and fall off. Grass goes up and it withers. That's what our flesh is like. It's temporary and it's passing. And at times that can leave us incredibly afraid. So we try to escape those feelings at times. We, we come up with a plan B. We generate something besides faith. What, what can I do? The, the beatnik writer Williams Burrow, William S. Burroughs Jr. Um, wrote a line once where he said, kick is the momentary freedom from the aging, nagging, frightened flesh. Now, I think when we recognize we have this fear that isn't really promoting faith, we try to find something that will elate us beyond it, that will give us freedom. But even as he was trying to celebrate these these personal moments of revelation, Burroughs is saying it's momentary. But what God brings to Abram in the midst of his frightened flesh is himself. 
not a momentary escape, not, not a plan B. He just presents himself. Verse 2 and 3, Abram will answer back and say, O Lord God, what will you give me? I continue childless in the air of my house as Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. He's listened to the promise of God that he'll have all these offspring and descendants. He and his barren wife have trusted faithfully, and now it's almost a decade later. And he wonders, why didn't God do this? He wonders why when he looks at his circumstances, they don't present themselves as square to the promise of God. When he looks only at where his life is and what God has said, there is such a distance that he lays out and says, God, I don't have what you've promised. I'm going to have to go through this legal route of taking a servant and making him my heir, which was the protocol in his day. Because too often we live only by what we see. We hear the promise in the moment, and we're willing to follow after God. But as soon as that voice quiets, the echo dims from our ear, we just look at what we can see again. St. Paul will write this to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5, 4 through 7. Just listen, I don't have a slide for it. For while we are still in this tent, this earthly body, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. We need more. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. It's the common problem of a pilgrim. If we're walking by the presence and call and provisions of a person we do not see, in a flesh that won't inherit all the promises of the kingdom of God, the tension of how do I do that and not become afraid is normal, especially if we start looking only at our circumstances. If your circumstances become the driving force of your faith walk, you're not really worshiping and following God. You're worshiping and following results. And you're going to be a very up and down person given the day. It's just a myopia that takes us to such a narrow sight. God of the universe. God of all. God of every man and woman. God who can hear the calls of every person instantaneously. is not limited just by what's going on in, in my portfolio. On my calendar. In my home. We want it in our time and what we can see rather than God's time and what he has declared we need to believe. It's a time for a childless old man, a warrior who did not ask for the trauma of war, and a wanderer who still has no place to call his own and no people to call his own to toe the line. It's a place where faith has to be acted upon. God doesn't chastise Abram, though. It's important to note that. There's a big gap between faith that has doubt, that's called normal, and disbelief. Think, think of when it was the time for Jesus to be born, and the angel Gabriel showed up to Zechariah in the temple, John the Baptist's father, and said, this is what's going to happen. Your wife is going to have this child who will be the forerunner of the Messiah, even though you're very old. And Zechariah's response is, how is that going to happen? And Gabriel says, yeah, that wasn't a really good response on your part, so I'm going to make you mute until this actually happens, which by the way, is the superpower I've always wanted, just to instantly mute anybody who I didn't like what they said. And that's what happens. The, the angel will show up to Mary just a chapter later and said, you who are a virgin, favored one, you're going to have this child. And she says, how will this be? As she praises the Lord, and the angel tells her, doesn't say you're mute. See, there's a difference between a question of faith that enters into the presence of God and says, oh Lord God, oh sovereign God, I can't see this, my Lord, and I want to. I come to you with the discrepancy between my life and the promises you've made versus someone who says, that, that doesn't work. You failed. See, faith with doubt is a normal part of the pilgrim journey, and God is incredibly merciful in those situations, but it's very distinct from just straight-out disbelief that would end up accusing God, challenging his character, and saying the promises aren't true or effective. What are the points in your life where this has surfaced before, where you find this pattern in your life, where maybe you think the promises of God aren't for you? He doesn't look to you. He doesn't really care about you. 
Or you think the provisions of God, they're not really coming to me because I should have more. I'm entitled to something more at this point. I'm like, what are the common points where you're held back in your faith walk? What are the things that are anchors in that? What's held you back in the past? And how can you become a person who has faith in the promises and word of God in the midst of those things? It's not by escaping it. It's not by suppressing it and pretending that you're much stronger than you are and you don't really have doubt. It's by engaging in the revelation of God and having faith in that. Here's where the text continues. After Abram asks all these questions, it says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven. Number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. That verse, Genesis 15, 6, is going to be critical throughout the entire Bible. It's one of those verses where some scholars and commentators will say, getting this is the linchpin to understanding, the cornerstone for holding together all the covenants of God and understanding what the faith life is all about. He believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but a couple of critical things to note now. One is the specifics of the promise. God begins to amplify. There's this continued revelation of what this will look like. And he says, there'll be offspring, but it's going to be a child from your own body. That, that's, that's new info for Abram. He knew he'd have offspring, but maybe somewhere in his mind he'd begun to say, God didn't say from me, so maybe it's going to be the adopted nature of having Eliezer, and there'll be something from that. But that's not what God says. He, he clarifies the specifics of it. You kind of wish, as the text will go on, he had said, from your and Sarah's body, because Abraham is a guy like all the pilgrims of faith who can find his own plan B in the missing parts, like a dog who's hunting out a rabbit. I mean, he just gets it right away, because at some point Sarah's going to say, well, why don't you have sex with Hagar, the Egyptian maid? It'll still be from your body, and we can have this child and not wait any longer on this thing. Pilgrims awkwardly follow their Lord at times, even with the revelation that they get. But for a moment, he's freed. It's not the nagging, frightened flesh of saying, how will this happen? For a moment, his myopia is cured. When I was in grad school, uh, I began to develop a nearsightedness because they had us read constantly, right? We had to take a speed reading course to get through, just like this for hours and hours, month after month, year after year. And I went to my doctor and he said, it's strain. You're becoming nearsighted because all you're looking at are things that are this far away. And he said, I, you, you go home at night. I want you to look off on the horizon, find something to look at. There are no mountains. It was Plano, Texas, which is Tex-Mexican for a plane, right? It's not the real Mexican word, but someone came up with Plano. It's like a plane. So it's just flat. So we're looking at the water tower and I would just try to stare out there and focus on that. And it was by looking further that helped the eye strain that had me only looking at myself. God says, Abram, I've told you this, but I want you now to walk outside. I want you to look up at the stars. This is also a redemptive moment for Abram. Remember, he comes from Ur of the Chaldees, where they are moon worshipers of the moon god Nana. And Abram had undoubtedly, with his father, gone up in the ziggurat on Ur, that, that step pyramid, and looked out at the stars and the celestial bodies, and was probably told and rehearsed again and again, this is for this god. We don't know what he'll do, though. That this tells us these things might come to pass. There are some fortunes that maybe we can indicate. And now God retells this whole amazing canopy to him and says, Abram, this picture is for you to remember the number of offspring. When your head is down, look up and begin to look at this broader picture. I'm the God of the universe, not just your household. And, and you have to understand I have this bigger, expansive view that can already see the number of offspring that you have. I love that he tells him to count them. I have to wonder if Abram sat there going, 147, 100. God, I can't count them all. Right, that's the point. Like, how far did he get in that faithfulness? Just going, yeah, there, there are a lot. It is larger. He'd already told him in Genesis 13, your offspring is going to be like the dust under the feet that you, and you walk on the ground. But now it's not just where he's standing and, and where he would wander, but where he would stare and at what he would wonder when he looks up at this expanse of the sky. It's what the angels had said to the prophet Isaiah in the Holy of Holies. 
The whole earth is full of his glory. And Abram now finds under his feet and above his head this constant tale of God's faithfulness. The, the world begins to preach those endless sermons that the Psalms talk about. Psalm 8, 3, and 4, the psalmist will write this. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? See, God has cured Abram's myopia by taking him to a bigger place, a bigger vision than just, here's what's uncomfortable in my life right now. Here's the challenge that I have. He hears him. He's absolutely willing to embrace the dialogue of doubt with a faith pilgrim. But then he shows him something more beyond just that. There, there's a justification of Abram and his belief in this that St. Paul will camp on in the New Testament and build his whole theology of justification in the book of Romans and in Galatians. Abraham, it says, believed. It's literally Hebrew where we get the root for amen. He amened God. God said this, and Abram said, Amen. That, that actually sounds right. I believe you. Amen, God. And, and it was counted to him as righteousness because of the voice of God. He no longer said what, where, when, how. He simply said, amen. So be it is literally what amen means. And it was that faith that said, God, as you say. But he still has questions that will lead to this covenant. Look at Genesis 15, 7 through 11. Abram has asked... Uh, the question earlier and has been brought before the stars and now God speaks to him and says I I'm the Lord who brought you out from the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess but he said oh Lord God how am I to know that I shall possess it it's, it's not an amen at this moment there's still questions that are in his mind he said bring me a heifer three years old a female goat three years old a ram three years old a turtle dove and a young pigeon he brought him all these cut them in half and laid each half over against the other but he did not cut the birds in half and when the birds of prey came down the carcasses abram drove them away and we are totally confused as modern men and women in the 21st century why did god have abram slaughter a petting zoo this really just seems dark and weird now the bible has taken a scary halloween turn but abram actually knew exactly what god was doing this is a covenant whose form is known in this part of the world. It's not something that takes Abram by surprise. This is sort of the modern equivalent of God downloading contracts from LegalZoom.com and saying, I need you to sign this. We wouldn't go, well, I don't know what to do with paper and ink. We'd know exactly what was meant. See, there was this treaty that graders would make with lessers. It was called a suzerain vassal treaty. And what would happen is the, the grader would first give a preamble and say, let me remind you why I am greater than you, who I am and what I've done. That, that's really what God is saying when he says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you from Ur the Chaldees. And then there would be a contract that was made, and instead of ink and paper, they went with split animals. And the person who was the lesser would then walk between those split animals to say to his greater, his Lord, his superior, this is what I covenant to do to honor you and keep covenant with you, and the implication was, if I don't, may what happened to these animals happen to me. May my life be counted as worthless and over. May I be just ripped in pieces if I break this covenant. So he's, he's asked God a question, and God begins to, to break out this contractual obligation of covenant. He brings something of himself through the culture and customs of our times to communicate. How gracious, but also how precisely our God desires to communicate with us. It's not distant. He doesn't want us to have feelings that we try to interpret in what we're doing. He actually takes on the cultural norms of the day to speak into them. Covenant's critical. Again and again, God will bring this tension of covenant and his justice and his love where he'll say throughout the Bible, I, I can't bless you if you're disobedient. I can't be with you if you're disobedient. Your sin separates you from me. And the tension of him saying, I will always be with you. I will never forsake you. I will remember my promises and my blessings toward you. And it's that tension of what about the justice of God and the faithfulness of God? How does this work? See, that, that's the story narratively throughout the Bible. God makes this covenant with, with one man, like Adam. 
It says, keep this and these things will happen. Break it and these will happen. Then he'll make a covenant with Noah. This is how you have to live. He makes covenant with Abram here. He'll make covenant with Moses for the sake of the people Israel in Deuteronomy 29 and say, here's how this works. Keep this and this will happen. Break this, this will happen. He makes covenant with King David and they're all tied together. This seems to be the pattern of how God is dealing with his people. He makes a promise and marks how they keep and break it and shows himself to be faithful and at times is crushing in his response to his people breaking the covenant, even taking them out of the land, using some of the most brutal people the earth has ever known to do that. In the story of Abram, the covenant's laid out with that whole preamble, I'm the God who started you on this journey. Now you need to understand that I'm the God who's going to see you through in this journey. Preparations are made, the animals are cut. There's no further explanation from God because Abram understands this all. These animals that are cut will all be used in the Mosaic sacrificial system. It's something that carries on from this faith in Abram. And they're significant. They're symbols of this contract. And then God will give the particulars of the promise. Look at Genesis 15, 12 through 16. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold... Dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs and will be servants there. They will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they'll come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Lord shows up and there's dread. What's that all about? Well, this covenant is representing two things. It's representing the justice of God in keeping these obligations and the mercy and love of God in providing. And there's something about the justice of God that brings a dark dread to us. We can kid ourselves all we want about what our standing with God is in and of ourselves, but the Bible is particularly clear. There's none righteous, no, not one. No one seeks after God. None of us please him in and of our flesh. And when the holiness of God shows up in a sinful place, there's dread. Those things will be driven out. Think of Jesus on the cross taking sin. What happens? Darkness overcomes the earth. It's that, it's that moment where God's judgment presence is showing up as well as his holy presence. We see in Revelation, John will fall down as dead. We hear Isaiah the prophet say in Isaiah 6, Woe to me, I'm a man undone. I have unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. We call upon God casually at times. I, I know I do. And God talk without God's presence is easy to share offhandedly. But anything but light is an actual encounter with the living God. It should be tread on carefully, held with high esteem. And we should be men and women who listen carefully each time we hear that word spoken from an encounter. And God tells them some particulars. There's a journey that's going to continue. You're going to be sojourners. Your people will be sojourners. Oppression is coming. Don't be thrown by things that are about suffering. It's not all going to be easy. But he says, I haven't missed any of it. It's not a mistake. I'll bring justice. I'll protect and provide. I will be the shield, and you'll have great provisions. Here's how it's going to work for your kids. They're going to be oppressed. I'm going to bring them out of that, and they're going to be greatly blessed as they exit that place. And for Abram, maybe just to quell his soul who worries so, you'll live to an old age and you'll die at peace. And Abram's waiting now for this covenant, probably thinking, I have to walk through this in a minute. I'm a man who's doubted in my past, and yet I'm going to say to God, I'll be faithful to your promises. This will be the most challenging contract I've ever signed. But it doesn't work out the way Abram thinks. Look at 17 through 21 of the chapter. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot came and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt, and so on and so on, to all these people whose names I'm not going to read twice today. And if, if you mapped out where these people are, what this land is, it's, it's not far off from modern Israel. It's kind of those borders. And God said, I'm giving, I'm giving you title to this. this. This is where I make the promise. But the more surprising thing to Abram would be that God walked in the place of where the lesser should walk. 
He went through the animals, it's symbolically in this great stove, this oven and the smoke coming out, reminiscent of how God will lead his people out of Egypt. He leads Abram through this path, and he's the only one who takes on the covenant. What do we make of this covenant then by the end? Well, here's the core of this encounter of this covenant. First is that there's justification by faith in this encounter. It's so important for us to understand justification by faith. It's nothing new. It's not something that was invented the moment Abram believes. If we looked at Hebrews 11, 4 through 8, there should be a slide for that, we're going to see that faith justification existed in the time of pre, prior to the patriarchs. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. It wasn't just that Abel made a sacrifice, Cain made one as well. But there was faith behind it that made it justifiable, that made him a person of faith. It wasn't the ritual alone. Both men did ritual through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he could not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And then, by faith, Abram obeyed. See, it's always been a justification by faith. The works were evidence of the faithfulness, not what made us just before God. That thread will continue in the New Testament as St. Paul in his theological mind sees this as the critical piece of understanding the new covenant. Romans 4, 1 through 8 reads this way, and I might not have a slide for that, so just listen or turn there. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You get the idea, right? That if he's justified by what he did, he could say, you know what? I was smart enough to listen, and I counted all those stars, so God really owes me. He presents his resume to God, and God says, Abraham, I need you on my team. I felt a big hole, and it was an Abraham-shaped hole in my heart, and I needed you to come and fill that so we could have that. Sometimes we can convince ourselves of that, that God has called us and is using us because of what we can do. That's not why. He actually would have gotten by fine without us and will after we're gone. He'll, he'll still manage to make operations go without us here. It can't be something we've done. God doesn't owe or need anything, so that boasting is set aside. St. Paul will say, for what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6, he's quoting. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as is due, just paycheck, and to one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one who would who, to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count sin. Because what covenant ultimately does is have this merger of contract, of law, and love. There's language of law built into covenant. I'm presenting this, we go through these rituals, we sign it, everybody's now obligated. But here and also in Deuteronomy 29, other places of covenant, man, there's personal language. There's personal pronouns and relating the story. I, I'm, the, I'm your God who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees. When someone uses personal pronouns like that, it's, it's a closeness. If you say, yeah, my, my Susie did this, my, my Johnny did this, it's, it's a child or a spouse or a close friend. Uh, when I lived in Ireland for a while, they always used the expression, our so-and-so, if it was a family member. Our Bethany did this. And, and it's that closeness. So it's not just the harsh language of contract. It's also an expression of love. It's love and law meeting. And that's hard for us to get in the modern age because we see law as only protecting our self-interest. That's why it's there. 
And we're a people who are convinced in this modern world that it's our individual expression that completes everything that we owe. It's why marriage is taken so lightly by people. They don't see it as a covenant of law and love. They see it as, what do I get out of it? I'll be mean. If you make me really happy, I'll stay. But the day you don't make me happy, I go. That, that's not covenant. That's why we don't even understand this idea of, of law and love. And not, not every relationship has to be covenant where you're bound forever. Um, I like my barber, but if I find a barber who does a better job cheaper, I'm not going to say, well, I've covenanted with you to cut my hair poorly for the next 20 years. I'm moving on. I'm just going to go to the cheaper, better barber. But there's a place where our deepest human relationships are defined by covenant, that law and love has merged, that we've made a commitment, and we're going to love throughout that commitment, even if that person lets us down at moments. It only makes sense that this deep place of human relationship is a reflection of the deepest place of how we relate to God, this idea of covenant. And ultimately, the hero of this covenant, the deliverer from suffering, the offspring in whom all these other children will be born is Jesus. See, he makes sense of the covenant, and he answers the good theological question, are the covenants of God, the blessings of God, conditional or unconditional? And we usually break one of two ways on this. There are people who will value the law side more than the love side and say, yep, totally conditional. We have to do, do, do. We have to keep making sure we get all these things right. And there are people who will either feel an incredible justification of themselves because they think they've lived well enough or an incredible guilt and condemnation that God would never really care for them because all they see is the, the law side. Then there are those who are all about the love side. It doesn't really matter what you do. God is so loving that he's just always going to be there for you. And they, they skew the thing towards the unconditional side. Here's the reality of both. The conditional side was met by Jesus. Every violation of every covenant, every sin against God was met because Jesus took this and took the conditions of it. And when we understand that, that the contractual side was upheld by Jesus, then we understand the unconditional side. That the love of God is behind Jesus making this conditional sacrifice of taking on sin. If you get one, you get the other, and then you get the gospel. L let me close with this passage in Galatians 3. 7 through 9 says this, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abram saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Continuing verse 23, Now before faith came, we were held captive under law. Law alone doesn't save. Imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ you are sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring according to the promise. There's a middle verse that I haven't put up there, but I want to read, Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree, so that in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that we receive the promised spirit through faith. See, he took on the conditional breaking of covenant unconditionally. It's that merger of what a covenant is, law and love perfectly displayed. As the band comes up and we pause to celebrate communion, I'll give you a couple of thoughts at the end of, that are worth noting in our pilgrim journey through these covenants. A world that seems out of control or frustrating because it doesn't make sense in your daily planner does not nullify the promises of God. As a matter of fact, we probably need to look larger. We only see and determine on those levels. A, a world filled with people with really fragile egos will never really be satisfied by having more pleasure or more approval or more power and possessions. But like Abraham, we have to continue a pilgrim journey where we act on faith. We look, listen, and respond. And we find in that the faithfulness of God who takes conditions and will always love unconditionally. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, 
We are grateful for the moments where you engage us in our doubt. I pray that you would speak to men and women here in the midst of doubt and help us to consider these conversations the next time doubt creeps into our life. We thank you for that grace. We thank you that you don't need us to rely on to bring faithful completion to your promises. God, because we confess we would ruin them. We're so thankful, though, that Jesus would take on the conditions of the covenant who was perfect. And we thank you that it was a loving plan that would allow that to happen. Father, would you bless us with the faith of Abraham that could turn from momentary pause and loss and see more than the potential of promise, but the person who promised and provided. It's in Jesus that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Amen.